That's good. <laughs> well, that's great. I, Mitchell was a lot littler than graduation whenever we first met, so it's, it's been. Have you? Okay. Yeah. And she's 14. Man, you're making me feel old. Yeah. <laughs> 14 years. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Well, congratulations, Mitchell. Best of luck in your future. I'm sure you got good things ahead of you, for sure. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to keep doing the Facebook post thing. So if you don't ever feel comfortable being here, got it, track. We're going to keep posting on Facebook. We can ask Tom how to name it because he's much better at naming these sermons than I am. We, we've struggled with it. That's been a debate uh, for about eight weeks now. So. Um, so that's why she's up here with her phone. She's not surfing Facebook. She's, well, she might be if she can multitask. I don't know if you can do both at the same time. She's convinced me that she's videoing the thing, so we're going to go with that. So. Really good to be up here again, guys. I, uh, I enjoy being with you guys. There's something about coming together. Uh, this church means a whole lot to me. You guys mean uh, even more than that to me. So to be here is fantastic. So um, really excited that we can get back to worshiping God together. There's just something about doing it together. Not that we have a small group at our house. It's like we have a whole church there on our own, and it's a lot louder. But um, it's, it's good to be here. So. Whenever you're ready, we'll get we'll get going here. Action. Okay. So there's a bunch of major events in Christianity, right, that we celebrate. And we we actually missed one of the biggest ones, not being able to be here together. We celebrated Easter our own ways and our own places. But we celebrate some things, right? Christmas is a big one, we a big to do here. You know, the, the way I got introduced to this church building and a lot of you folks is from the Christmas service. Christmas is a big deal in Christianity. Easter, obviously a huge deal. Ascension Day, big deal. These major events in Christianity that we set aside and every year we talk about and we celebrate these things that have happened to just keep it fresh in our minds and about what it is that we're celebrating and, and the God that we're serving and what he's done and how it could be accomplished. Today is Pentecost. Pentecost. And on this day in AD, uh, well, we're going to say 30, just for round numbers, there's like 120 some people, right? And, and they followed this guy called Jesus. And they gathered together in Jerusalem. And as they were gathering and as they were there, suddenly the Spirit of God came down on them, filled each one of, one of them. The Bible describes it of tongues of fire. Amazing things happened. Really, on that day, the church was kind of born. That's what started all of this. But as that was going, really no person around in Jerusalem, none of the newspaper reporters, none of the historians of the time really captured it and caught it. We had 120 people gathered together. Now, what's to me always been amazing about this first group of Jesus followers is that they were just ordinary people. I mean, think about who we had in this group. We had uh, a handful of just regular guys. A few women were there. There were some fishermen. There were some farmers. There were some uh, servants. There was a tax collector. There were just a bunch of ordinary people that God spoke to and used to build his church. And think about what that church has done. It's lasted almost 2,000 years now. In, in less than a few hundred years, really, that little group of people had spread all over the world. It was a, a massive movement. And today, the church that follows Jesus Christ is like a billion people. That's a huge number. And that started with a small group of regular people gathering together to follow Jesus. So the question becomes, how did that happen? And why do we celebrate that today? Well, in, in that event, in that time, in that thing that we set aside to remember today, the church came in contact with the Spirit of God. And that changed things. It changed things for, for the better. We can now communicate with God. We now have the power of God working through us. But unfortunately, a lot of Christians... Uh, don't really understand the event that came to be with Pentecost, the, the, the amazing thing that happened there. So let's talk about Pentecost today a little bit. 
What we celebrate here is that word Pentecost, right? What that event was is the coming of the Spirit of God. The, the men and women that follow God, the men and women that follow after Jesus now have the Holy Spirit in them. The weird thing is, if you didn't come to church today or if you have a daily devotional, a lot of them will, will mention it. Maybe you have a, a church calendar that has the church events on there. If you didn't have one of those things today, you probably wouldn't have realized that today is Pentecost, right? Probably would have just passed by. Why? It's not the major festival that we make of the other things. It's not the major Christmas celebration. We can't miss that. The major Easter celebration, we can't miss that. But Pentecost isn't that thing that's celebrated in festivities. Now, I would say it's just as important as Easter and Christmas. It's a very key aspect of our ability to walk with Christ and to connect with Him. But for whatever reason, we don't have this big to do. There's not a, a Pentecost tree or, or anything like that, right? Why? I think there's a few reasons. One, I think we as people have a very hard time getting a grasp on the Spirit of God. It's, it's, a, it's a complex idea, right? We understand a baby. We understand death. We understand life. We don't understand all that comes into the Spirit of God. And I would say we don't all really understand exactly what happened that day when the Spirit of God touched people, interacted with people. Maybe, maybe it's that we don't see the Spirit as something as, as easy to understand as the baby or as sweet as the baby or as, as, uh, as fun to talk about and, and uh, put pictures to angels singing and shepherds gathering and gifts being passed around. All of that is easy for our minds to grasp. Spirit of God seems a little bit out there, right? Seems a little bit uh, uh, harder to understand, but it's still a very important part of our lives. Now, there's the other thought. Maybe Pentecost is not as big of a celebration because we haven't figured out a way to commercialize it yet. All the other holidays, we got that figured out, right? Hallmark is capitalized. We've got decorations. We've got all of this going on. We haven't figured out the cultural significance of Pentecost yet. It's not a national holiday by any means, right? All of that combines into a fact that probably not many of us knew walking into church today that it was Pentecost. This day that we celebrate the Spirit of God working in us. I think a lot of it is driven because of that uh, that concept that we can't really understand the Spirit. We either fear the Spirit of God or we ignore the Spirit of God. And we know through Scripture that, that God says He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what that means for us is that the Spirit that we're celebrating coming on to those folks a, a long time ago, the Spirit of God that works within us is the same Spirit that was there in creation when God spoke everything into existence, the same Spirit that was there to help lead the Israelites, the same Spirit that was there uh, that was at Christmas whenever Jesus was born, and the same Spirit that's with us in our hearts today. That's the same Spirit of God. So we celebrate the things that the Spirit has been a part of. We acknowledge the work that the Spirit of God can do. And for some reason, we're just a little bit fearful of the Spirit of God. I want to read some of Jesus' words as he talks about uh, the promise of this day coming. It's in John chapter 14. If you've got your Bible, turn there. He, he explains it in a way that maybe will help us understand what it is the Spirit of God does for us. Maybe take a little bit of that fear away. Remember, this is Jesus promising what's coming. This is Jesus talking about what's coming next. So if you've got your Bibles, John chapter 14. I'm going to start in verse 15. I'm going to read uh, quite a bit here, but let's start in verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will live also." 
And that day you will know that I am my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all these things and bring you remembrance, all things I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What's Jesus talking about here? He says it in a few different words, at least in this translation. Helper, right? He calls it his Holy Spirit. We've seen counselor. We've seen, you know, this, this presence of God in our lives that's here to help guide us and direct us. He talks about it not in a scary way, but he talks about it being the spirit of truth to help us be enlightened to the things of God. To help us see what God is working in our lives. To, to help be uh, driven the right direction by the power of God. Jesus was very much aware that he was leading a group of people here, a small group of people, that had big things in store for them. They were going to change the world. That's not even exaggerating in the slightest. They were going to do great things by the power of God. He knew that. But he also knew they were scared to do that alone. So he said, I am not going to leave you alone. And that's what the Spirit is here for us. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit we're talking about here at Pentecost, coming on to this group of people in tongues of fire, is the same Spirit that works within us every day to show us that God loves us, to keep us close to God, and to point us in the direction that God wants us to go. On that day in Pentecost, the power of the Holy Spirit was released to the people who followed God. What's Jesus say over and over again? Loving him, keeping his commandments, staying close to him results in the power of the Holy Spirit being unleashed within us. And the Holy Spirit is powerful. Think of it this way. Power can either be unleashed or it can be harnessed. It's like gasoline. Okay, If you take a 10-gallon barrel of gasoline, throw it on a fire and light it, you're going to get a big explosion, right? Real quick release of all of that. But you can take that 10 gallons of gasoline, put it in a minivan, and haul six kids for 200 miles, okay? The same amount of gasoline can do something big and powerful and extravagant right now, or it can used, be harnessed and trickle down and be controlled. What the Holy Spirit has is that power, that power of fire. And we see it throughout Scripture described as fire. Fire is an amazing thing, and when you can harness it, great things can happen, right? It can be dramatic, and it can be big, or it can be like the Spirit works in us probably every day with that staying power, with that long-haul energy that we can keep going day after day, seeing more about God, learning more about God, connecting more about God. See, the Holy Spirit sometimes comes like Pentecost, and it does something dramatic in us. And we've probably felt that at some point, where we just had to say something, we had to do something, or we, we sang that verse and that song extra loud because it connected with us. But more often, it works quietly in us, every day, right? Every day. That, that little nudge to, to do something extra, that, that little thought that maybe that's not the right idea to act that way or say those words, that thought that we should apologize or make something right. The Holy Spirit brings power into our lives, but more often than not, it's in a quiet, unobtrusive way. Right? Not raining down tongues of fire, but pushing us, nudging us, speaking softly to us in a way that makes a huge difference. There's a story about a, a ship that was, it was sunk, and it was... Uh, it was causing problems there near New York. It was this big ship, and it was uh, kind of in the way, and it was like right where something wanted to be built. So they brought all kinds of powerful machinery and big stuff, and they tried to get the ship, but it, it just couldn't budge. It was just too buried. 
Somebody had a, a really good idea. They thought, why not let the ocean raise the ship up? So they took some really strong cables and they attached them to the, to the hull. They waited for the tide to go down and they attached those cables to a barge above, made sure they were good and tight. And as the tide rose, the barge rose and it pulled that sunken ship out of the ocean. See, sometimes that's how the Spirit of God works. We can think of it as this big, mighty machinery coming in to make drastic changes in our lives. And sometimes that's exactly what God does. But a lot of times he's like the tide where unless you're watching it and paying attention and seeing every step, you don't even really notice. But before long, you look back and things are entirely different. God's Spirit comes to us and works quietly and slowly. But don't be, don't be uh, mistaken here. Quietly and slowly does not mean less powerful. God comes with power to show us and give us the energy and the strength and the knowledge to do the job that God has called each of us to do. God will continue to lead us in the path that God is calling us to. This is what God's Spirit does. And first and foremost, what God's Spirit is going to help us do is point us to the things of God. Point us to what it is that He wants in our lives. Point us into the calling that we have had from God and the power that we've got, not because of what we've done or what we've accomplished, but by what Jesus has accomplished for us. The Holy Spirit wants us to experience the joy and the goodness of Christ in our lives. And that's why the Holy Spirit doesn't only give us power, sometimes it also convicts us. It shows us where we've fallen short. It shows us what our sins are in our lives. The Holy Spirit is very powerful, and then it can show us that we're not as good as we think we are. And convincing us of that is a pretty big task, right? But we all know, we've realized at some point that we're wrong. Paul says this in Romans, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Another reason I think we're maybe a little bit afraid of the Spirit is because we know we can't trick it. That, that conviction comes from within us, that's not something we can talk ourselves out of. Have you ever been so convicted to go apologize to somebody you, you just couldn't help but do it? It's, it's one of those things you just get convicted to do. I, I had that, this, so working from home is a, an entirely kind of different situation, right? Everything is on the, the phone and you're not face-to-face. -face and, and this is how I interact. with. I like face, facial reactions, so I like to see your faces. And when you smile, it makes me know I'm at least doing something. Head nods work unless you're sleeping. Then I get a different kind of head nod. But I like the reaction, right? So over the phone is a little bit different and I had a kind of an awkward encounter with a, a colleague over the phone and and I hung up and and instantly knew that wasn't any good and I tried as hard as I could to talk myself out of calling this person back and apologizing but no matter how much I tried to talk myself I couldn't talk myself out of it why because I knew I was wrong that's the Holy Spirit right that's the Holy Spirit we've all been there been convicted that we've done something incorrect, that we need to make something right, that we need to go to God and be cleansed. The Spirit is going to keep showing us that, pointing us that direction. Paul's pretty clear, though. That's not a bad thing. Being convicted of our sin and knowing that we have to go talk to God isn't so God can say, ha ha, sinner boy, you are bad. That's, that's not what the Spirit of God wants to do. The Spirit of God says, you are my son. Come to God and get cleansed and forgiven because God wants to continue to know you. And God knows that sin comes between us and him. It divides our relationship. So taking it out of there as quickly as possible is a good thing, not a painful thing. We should look at it as the Spirit is guiding us to the things of Jesus Christ because God has a job for all of us. And that same God that had a job for the first 120 people gathered there in Jerusalem when the Spirit came down in tongues of fire and ended up being a church now of a billion people is the same Spirit that works within you. And He's got the same kind of ideas for you. We're all part of this church of God that does something fantastic. 
I read the story of, of this, uh, this minister. His name is uh, Russ Blowers, and, and he's this, uh, this guy. And he had this uh, meeting in, in which he said this, and I'm just going to read what he said, uh, talking about his, uh, his job. So he was, he was in this, uh, like a rotary club meeting, in a rotary club meeting, and he's, everybody's kind of going around and explaining who they are and what they do, and then it came to Russ. He's a minister. This is what he says. I'm with a global enterprise. We have branches in every country of the world. We have our representatives in nearly every parliament and boardroom on earth. We're into motivation and behavior alteration. We run hospitals, feeding stations, crisis pregnancy centers, universities, publishing houses, and nursing homes. We care for our clients from birth to death. We are into life insurance and fire insurance. We perform spiritual heart transplants. Our original organizer owns all the real estate on earth plus an assortment of galaxies and constellations. He knows everything and lives everywhere. Our product is free for the asking because asking, there's no, not enough money to buy it. Our CEO was born in a hick town, worked as a carpenter, didn't own a home, was misunderstood by his family, hated by his enemies, walked on water, was condemned to death without a trial, and arose from the dead, and I talk with him every day. This is the organization that we're with, all of us. And we may be this little country church, right, here in Bond County, not a whole lot going on around us, right? But we are part of the most amazing organization to ever exist. We are a part of that. And we're a part of it, not because we were interviewed and selected as the best candidates, not because we've got a long list of skills that, that can't be found anywhere else, but because the Holy Spirit came into us and called us and enlightened us and gave us gifts and kept us, kept us pointed to the things of God and kept us focused on the truth. And he knows that when he calls, we'll answer. And he knows that when he says, go, we'll go. And he knows that when he teaches, we will learn. He also realizes that we'll make mistakes and he's going to show them to us. It's not because of what we've done that we're here. It's because of what God has done in our lives. And this is why Pentecost is that big of a deal to celebrate today. We can interact with the creator of all things. We can interact with the, the CEO. We can interact with the, the one who understands and knows all and is everywhere. We can connect with him and we can be led by him dwelling within us. That's what Jesus talks about here. We love him, we follow him, he inhabits with us, he lives with us, he guides us, he's here in our hearts. And when we want to call out and connect with him, all we have to do is that. We don't have to schedule a meeting or make an appointment. We don't have to, to uh, go anywhere special. We, we can connect with God in the way that he's connected with us, which is really amazing, right? Because even in a time when the church can't gather together in churches and their physical buildings, the church didn't go anywhere. We, we kept connecting with God and meeting with God and, and, and being with God in our own way. We can do that because the church isn't defined by a space. It's defined by everybody sitting here. And today we can celebrate that, that we can worship God in our house, in our car, in a tree stand in the woods. We can worship God in church together. We can worship God in private, in our own house. We can worship God in silence. We can worship God with song. We can worship God in whatever way God is connecting with you at that time. That's possible because the Holy Spirit lives within us. You ever read the Old Testament and how we had to talk with God and connect with God, right? Like one person could go into the Holy of Holies and it was so uh, uh, breathtaking to be in there. He had to have a rope tied around his ankle just in case so he could be drug out if he didn't make it out alive. That's the connection with God that people had. Behind levels of curtains, behind people and structure. Because God didn't interact with folks then like he does now. Today, he meets with us and he connects with us and he lives in us. What started that? Pentecost. The Holy Spirit coming down and speaking to this group of ordinary people. Today is Pentecost. We celebrate Pentecost, and we're going to celebrate that here today. And hopefully we can leave today blessed by the Holy Spirit, because that's what God does for us. He connects with us, and he wants to do that today. Not just here. Uh, let's, I'll say the connection with God goes as we leave today, too. So reach out to God. Connect with God. Listen to the Holy Spirit guide you and direct you. 
It may be a conviction of your sin. It may be to go do something great. It may be to open up the Bible, the scripture, or the song and do something in private. Don't know what it is, but listen to the Spirit of God and celebrate the fact that we can connect with him here this morning. Anybody have any questions, comments, thoughts today? Really good to see everybody again this morning. And we'll do what I haven't done in a long time. Close a sermon with a song. Let's do that. Sing.